Good morning. Open your Bibles to 2 Timothy. We'll be in chapter 2, verse 10. Paul says, Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we ask for your blessing upon our time. Lord, I pray that you would fill each one of us with your spirit and cause your word to enter our hearts and allow us to behold your glory. Allow us to behold the glory of your son and and what he endured and may we be transformed into his image. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us, Lord, that this would impact us in such a way um, where we would be completely different leaving here. Lord, may we receive your word with humility and meekness and um, Lord, just prepare our hearts this morning. In your name, amen. Paul writes to Timothy as he's in prison as he's reaching the end of his life. And he writes to this man who he describes as his beloved child in the faith. It's as though it were the last words that he would give his, his beloved son. As a father would give his beloved son last words as he's uh, reaching the end of his life. And most men, when they're in prison, they give their children wisdom and they say, don't live the same life that I lived, which got me into prison. But Paul, on the other hand, is exhorting his beloved child to live the same life which he lived, which got him into prison in the first place. And he calls him to a life of suffering for the gospel. And he does not exhort Timothy in this way, thinking that Christians will become more accepted or more uh, welcomed in society, but he does so knowing very well that in the last days will come times of difficulty. And that evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse. And that all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And so therefore, Paul gives Timothy this final exhortation in in 4 verse 5. He says, But as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of the evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Why, Paul? Why do you call him to this? And he says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. He's pretty much saying, Timothy, I'm reaching the end of my life, therefore finish what I have begun. It's as though Paul finishing the race is making sure that the baton is secure in the hand of Timothy, who's going to continue bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. And so Paul calls Timothy multiple times in this letter to to share in suffering for the gospel in 1 verse 8, and in 2 verse 3, to share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And we know that Timothy does this very thing, that he goes and he proclaims this gospel and he lives this godly life, and that he's faced with much opposition. At the end of his life, he proclaims this gospel, and then he's beaten, and then dragged through the streets and stoned because of his faithfulness to proclaim this gospel. So Paul not only endured suffering himself, but also longed that his beloved child, Timothy, would endure suffering. So then let us look into the heart of Paul, which would not only endure suffering himself, but would also long that Timothy and us would endure suffering for this gospel. I have three questions I want to ask from this text. First, I want to ask, what does Paul endure? Second, for whom does he endure these things? And third, to what end? Are these things endured? So first, what does Paul endure? Our text says very clearly, Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect. We know with the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9 that he was uh, called and saved, that he would be an instrument of God to carry the name of Jesus before the Jews and the Gentiles. And so God uh, called him to be a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. And so he lives this life of godliness. And as we already looked in chapter 3, verse 12, all who desire to live this godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 
And so Paul is faced with much opposition because of his uh, zeal f- to proclaim this gospel. If we look at the context of 2 Timothy, we see that everything which Paul endures. It says in the previous verse that he's in prison and that he's bound in chains as though he were a violent criminal. It says that the manner of his life is that of being poured out as a drink offering and that the time of his departure is at hand. It says that Luke the physician is with him, likely tending to his many infirmities that he's having, all these sufferings that he's having. It's also said that winter time is arriving. Those stones in which he's now dwelling are bitterly cold and those chains around his arms and ankles are freezing. And he does not even have a cloak to warm him even in the slightest. And with this, he's isolated, not by choice just to get away from people, but it says that his first defense, none came to stand by him, but all deserted him. And that all who were in Asia turned away from him. And so he's faced with much opposition from people such as Alexander the coppersmith, who's said to have done him great harm, who strongly opposed this message. He's surrounded by brutal, treacherous, reckless, and heartless people. And so Paul, at the end of his letter, describes his life as that of a soldier and an athlete. He says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race. If you examine the apostle as a soldier, you would see a man whose armor has lost all of its shine, all indented and slashed from swords. You would see a helmet that is indented from arrows and a sword that is wet with blood. You'd see boots that are so worn out that you'd be surprised that a man could even wear them. And you would see a shield that seems like it's been attacked greatly. You'd see a soldier who's all cut up and bruised and is limping around on the battlefield. If you examine him as an athlete, you'd see a man who's covered in sweat, whose heart pounds in his chest, whose lungs are gasping for breath, whose tongue pants for water. You'd see a man whose muscles are fatigued, whose stomach is cramping from the intensity of the run whose feet are blistered and bleeding. If you compare Paul to the average American Christian, you you see such a great difference. As as most of us American Christians, as soldiers, our our armor shines so much that we can see our own reflection. And our helmets are pristine and our boots are as good as new and our sword remains in our sheath. If you look at us as athletes, it's as a simple stroll in the park. And this... This run and this fight is something which was a part of Paul's whole life as a Christian, as he states in 2 Corinthians 11. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. That's 195 lashes. Three times I was beaten. With rods. One time I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, and danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, and toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold, and exposure. And apart from other things, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. So this and much more is he enduring. It's not just because he's an unlikable guy, it's because he's proclaiming this gospel and he's zealous to bring this gospel to the furthest reaches of the world. He could have easily avoided this hardship. He could have taken that American dream route that many now do and and just isolate himself from bringing the gospel to anybody. But such a consideration was as a curse to him as he exclaims in 1 Corinthians 9 saying, Woe to me if I do not preach this gospel. To not preach this gospel to him was a horrifying thing. The very thought of it sickened him. And so a few verses later in chapter 9 of Corinthians, we see how he is willing to be a servant to all people that he might win them to Christ. And so he says, I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. He's willing to endure 
being a servant to all people, that they would obtain this salvation. And it goes to the extent of his willingness to endure. As in Romans 9.3, he says, For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. He's saying there that he's willing to endure even hell itself if that meant that others would obtain this salvation. If that meant that others would have Christ Jesus. The greatest suffering that could be known to a soul, he is willing to endure that others would have this salvation. Many of us are not even willing to endure even a tenth or even a hundredth, perhaps not even a thousandth of what the apostle endured. But some of you might object and say, but Logan, I'm not the apostle, therefore I have no reason to endure suffering to that extent. But I answer you and say, neither was Timothy, yet he followed Paul in all his sufferings. And Philippians 2.5 says, have this mind. What mind? It's this mind of humility, this mind of being a servant, even as Christ was a servant to us. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Yet some of you also might object and say, but Logan, I'm not an evangelist. I'm not called to be an evangelist. I'm not gifted in that area. And to you, if you are a Christian, then you are an evangelist of some sort. You are called to proclaim this gospel in some way, shape, or form. 1 Peter 2.9 says, You, Christian, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession. Why, Peter? He says that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness. So your call, therefore, as a Christian is to go and proclaim this gospel. And when suffering comes, for it will come. And when it comes, you endure it. And so Paul did this very thing. He proclaimed this gospel and suffering came and he endured it. But why did he endure these things? Or rather, For whom did he endure these things? Our second point. The text says, I endure everything for the sake of the elect. What is meant here by the elect? I do not want to go into major depth into this topic as Pastor Ken is going to be touching base on it in four or five years in chapter nine and we'll be touching base thoroughly on that topic. But I do want to look at it and get a proper understanding so that we can know the relationship between election and evangelism. So the elect are those who were chosen before the foundation of the world, those whom Christ died for, who would end up one day being justified and glorified in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1, 4 says, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him. Romans 8 29 through 30. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he may be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. The elect are those who will inevitably hear the gospel and they will follow. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. They will hear the gospel regardless and they will follow Jesus. They will believe it. And the elect here in 2 Timothy are referred to then as those who have not yet come to the knowledge of the truth. Those who have not yet obtained this salvation, but they one day will. So we could understand them as Christ's sheep who are now wandering without their shepherd, but the moment they hear the shepherd's voice call them, they will follow. They will believe. The moment that gospel is proclaimed to their ears and they hear the voice of Christ, they will follow. Oftentimes we think as Reformed Christians that because of this doctrine of election that we have the excuse to not go and proclaim this gospel because, hey, God's going to save those whom he's elected anyways, with or without us, so... I'm just going to sit around and, and live my life the way I want to live it. But the exact opposite ought to be true about us. That it's because of this doctrine, because of our belief in this, that it's to drive us and motivate us to proclaim this gospel to the world. 
Let us say there was no expectation that the elect would come to a knowledge of the truth. Let us say that this doctrine was not a, a doctrine. Then all this suffering which the apostles enduring, or, or any suffering for that matter, for the sake of the gospel, would not be worth it. Rather, it's because of this promise that God will faithfully save those whom he has called, that we can be confident that they will hear this gospel and they will follow. And so that creates a, a, a zeal within us and, and drives us uh, to that end. Consider a car dealership giving away free cars. That's a great deal, right? And now because of that great deal, you have a line that stretches from the car dealership that goes on miles and miles and miles. And you finally arrive at that car dealership to get in line so you can get your free car. And you notice that there is probably not going to be enough cars for you. And so you look off in the distance and you see a sign that says only 1,000 cars left. And you look at the line, you look at the sign, you say, yeah, I'm not going to endure that. That is not worth it. But let's say, however, there's an unlimited amount of cars at this car dealership that they're giving away for free. Don't ask me how. It, it just is. <laughs> How much more so are you willing to endure that line for hours, perhaps days, maybe even weeks to get your hands on that free car? It is because of the expectation that you will obtain something that makes all sorts of suffering worth enduring. Or consider running. If you're like me, running is a form of suffering. And if there was no uh, guarantee of obtaining good health or losing weight, then running for most of you, maybe a few of you not, but running would not be worth it. There's a few athletic people out there I can, I can see, but most of you would hate that. So we therefore ought to have confidence in, in all sorts of methods of evangelism, whether that's handing out a tract, it's preaching the gospel on the streets, preaching the gospel to your coworker, your family, or your boss, singing hymns, or, or whatever other method, cold turkey evangelism or relationship evangelism, whatever it might be, we ought to have confidence that the word of God cannot be bound, but it goes forth freely and it accomplishes all which God desires. It does not return to him void. So we ought to also be confident that all our suffering is a part of God's plan to bring the gospel to the ears of the elect so they would follow. And where the elect live is not in the lush green pastures, not in the peaceful lands, not in our comfort zone. They live outside our comfort zone. They live in the dark valleys of the shadows of death. They live in the rugged terrain in every nation, every tribe, every religion, every people. They live in all these different places which to get to them involves much suffering. Consider with me the uh, missionary John Patton, who was a missionary to the southern seas, which were islands that were populated with cannibals. The missionaries that arrived prior to him were killed within 30 minutes and shortly after were eaten. Him and his first year there, both his wife and his newborn son died. He was faced with constant fevers. He constantly had muskets pointed at him. He had a dagger pressed upon his chest. He had to sleep with his clothes on because of the imminent threat that the natives posed. He had a night where he was hiding in a tree, sleepless, as they were calling out his name as they were seeking to kill him. Yet his desire, his prayer for his children is this, that they would make it their pride and joy to live and die in carrying Jesus and his gospel into the heart of the heathen world. What is a, the pursuit of such a man? What drives a man to endure this suffering and desire also that his beloved children would endure this? Here's what he says. That those who have tasted of this highest joy, the joy of the Lord, will never ask again, is this life, that is the life I just described, is this life worth living? His greatest joy was seeing the heathen come home to Christ and he was so willing to endure anything to that end. And so the elect, they live in these places outside of our comfort zone, but the reality of election makes reaching them with the gospel worth it. 
So therefore, Paul knows that his imprisonment is for the Lord. That he's there according to God's providence. That he's not there by accident. And that God's word cannot be hindered in any way whatsoever from reaching the ears of the elect. He knows that all of hell may attempt to thwart God's purpose to bring this gospel to the elect, but they will never succeed. Election means that God's hand sovereignly operates over all the world with precise accuracy, using all things, visible and invisible, to bring this purpose to fruition, to to bring the gospel to the elect. And that no form of suffering can hinder God from accomplishing his purposes. And that all things, all sufferings, literally everything, is going to be used of God to that end. Suffering then becomes worth it when we understand this doctrine, regardless of what the cost may be. That no prison can imprison the word of God. No chain can bound the word of God. No sword can slay the word of God. And as the grass fades, the flower withers, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And that the word of God cannot be bound. There is therefore no plan that is able to be devised by Satan which can outwit the all-wise mind of God nor is there an army in hell strong enough to outfight the Almighty God. God's word goes forth freely, and nothing can prevent it. And not only does the enemy attempt and fail to hinder God's word from going out, but their very attempts to hinder God's word is actually used of God to bring this gospel further, to spread it even more. Paul says in Philippians 1.12, as he's in prison again, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Therefore, everything is a part of God's mysterious plan to bring the elect to himself. So enduring everything is worth it. Doing literally everything is worth it because everything is being used to that end. We can't look at a single circumstance or single time when we're persecuted or hated for the name of Christ and say that God is not using that to that end. He uses everything. And therefore, everything is worth enduring. So Paul therefore knows that this imprisonment is no accident of God, but that it is according to God's perfect plan. But what happens now when when the elect, they hear this gospel? To what end does Paul endure these things? Our third point, to what end does he endure this? He endures all these things not without a purpose, not just to make a point, not just to tell everybody what he thinks, but he endures suffering with a purpose. The purpose is that the elect may obtain the salvation in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It's a salvific purpose. That is a purpose that brings salvation. It is an eternal purpose. It's not just a temporary purpose. He does not endure this imprisonment because he was trying to bring clean water and homes to poor people or medicine to sick people. He's in prison because he was bringing the gospel to dying people. He could, like many missionaries today, just go out to the world and and build houses and bring medicine and bring clean water. But without the gospel, with only giving those things, then all those efforts are in vain. I'm not saying that those things are bad, but they're actually good and they are necessary, but they are only temporary. So those things, they supply a temporary need that we need as human beings. But Christ Jesus supplies an eternal need. Because sinners, regardless if they have clean water or dirty water, medicine or no medicine, good health or bad health, a home or no home, will end up in a grave and they will stand before God in judgment. Whether they had water or house or medicine will not play any part in how they are judged. But if they have Christ Jesus, then all of that suffering for their sake is worth it. 
And how unloving would it be as if, if we only sought to give people these temporary things while depriving them of this eternal gospel, of this glorious Jesus? How unloving would that be as Christians who have this gospel if we don't bring it to dying sinners? That is what they need. That is what every human being needs more than anything. Here's your application. I therefore exhort you to share in suffering for the gospel, to take up your cross and follow Christ, to go outside the camp and bear the reproach that he endured. You have this gospel as Christians, so therefore go and proclaim this gospel. But Logan, I don't know who the elect are, so to whom do I take this? Charles Spurgeon, he illustrates illustrates this and says, If God painted a yellow stripe on the backs of all the elect, I would go around and lifting up shirts. But because he hasn't, I will proclaim whosoever. And when whosoever believes, then I will know that he is elect. So therefore, as Christians, we proclaim whosoever believes will not perish but have eternal life. And when they believe, when they follow Christ, we know then that they are elect. We don't need to concern ourselves who and who not we will proclaim this gospel to, but we proclaim to all as if all were elect to the scary-looking people and the nice-looking people, everybody. And we know about this salvation. It is in Christ Jesus. And so we're, we're shown here what we proclaim. We proclaim Christ Jesus. There's no salvation apart from Christ Jesus. There's no salvation outside of Christ Jesus. Salvation is in Christ Jesus and in Christ Jesus alone. So we go and we proclaim Christ Jesus. We don't proclaim a six-day creation for a sinner to be saved. We proclaim Christ Jesus. That is what our souls need. That is the only name in whom there is salvation. And so also, the eternal glory is with Christ Jesus. You cannot find eternal glory without Christ Jesus. There is no heaven without him. So we proclaim Christ to all. And this eternal glory, which which we have in Christ Jesus, which we Christians have, it's the eternal glory of having peace and reconciliation and oneness for all eternity with the Lord of glory. Do your thoughts of heaven make you just immediately think, oh, I get to partake of this? Or does it create longings within you that others too would obtain this, that others too would partake of this eternal glory? Or do you only want to partake of it yourself? So therefore, endure suffering, just like the text says, that they also may obtain the salvation in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. You already have Christ Jesus, Christian. You already have him. Go and proclaim Christ that others too may have him. That they might have salvation that is in Christ Jesus and eternal glory that is with Christ Jesus. Go and proclaim Christ Jesus to all. Endure the loss of your money to to raise support for missionaries. Endure the loss of sleep to pray for laborers to be sent into the field. Endure the loss of your health and your prosperous lifestyle for the sake of the elect. Endure the loss of comforts of all sorts. Perhaps you are even called to leave this country or leave this state or leave your home to go and bring this gospel to to other people. Go and endure the loss of your American dream of your comfortable and fancy lifestyle for the sake of the elect. Are you at least willing? Are you at least willing to endure anything or everything for the sake of the elect? Are you willing to lose the loss of your health? Are you willing to lose the loss of your home? Are you willing to lose the loss of all sorts of comfort? Are you even willing, like Paul, to endure even hell itself that others would have Christ Jesus? Does your desire to see others saved go to that extent? We all know those things which we are unwilling to endure. Whether that be our our social status, whether that be our job or or our friends, or any other relationship. We know those things that we're unwilling to let go of in order 
to bring this gospel to the world. Some of us are not even willing to be a servant to all people that by all means we might save some. Some of us are not even willing to put on a mask just for five minutes to share the gospel with somebody who does wear a mask. And on the other hand, some of us are not willing to even go and contact any human being because we don't want to get this virus. We have Christ Jesus. We have eternal life. Others don't. Others are dying. We need to proclaim this and be a servant to all that by all means, all means, there's nothing that can be excluded. All means we might save some. So how can we possibly say, I wish to see sinners come to Jesus, but at the same time say, but I am unwilling to endure this or that or anything for their sake. If you are not willing to endure anything for the sake of the elect, then how can you say that you desire to see them come to Christ Jesus? Truly, your desire to see sinners saved will be in proportion to your willingness to endure for them. Endure anything for them. So whether it be your wallets, your prayers, or proclaiming the gospel in the streets, or going to a cannibalistic island, go. Proclaim this gospel and endure all things. Oh, how we'd see revival, that revival that we've been praying for as a church take place if we grasped this message, if it entered our hearts and changed us. How we would see such a wonderful thing take place. 1 John 3.16 By this we know love, that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. If you understand this passage in the bigger context, that the brothers is the brothers of all time, not just your current brothers, not just those that are already Christians, but those who will one day be Christians, your future brothers and sisters in Christ. It is they whom we ought to lay down our lives for. Why? Because Christ laid down his life for us. He laid down his life for us. Shall we not for them? And if anything, my friends, if anything enters your heart this morning, if anything, uh, if, if you haven't been paying attention at all, may you pay attention to at least this and may this uh, consideration draw your heart to apply this passage. Shall we consider our Lord who endured everything for our sake, who endured literally everything, not just many things, but he endured everything, Shall we consider him and not also be willing to endure everything for the sake of others? Let us consider Jesus this morning, who not only endured many things, but endured literally everything for the sake of the elect. Behold Jesus Christ, his glory, his beauty, his majesty is infinite, perfect, incalculable. He's wonderful. And he is self-sufficient, meaning he doesn't need any one of you. He didn't need to create anything. He was perfectly content in the contemplation of himself. He does not need this world. He does not need human beings. Even more so, he does not need to save any of us from our sins. He has no obligation to save us. But he desired to show us mercy. He desired to be humbled, became a man where he was spat upon, the most beautiful face spat upon and slapped and beaten and mocked. He wore a crown of thorns. The king of glory wore a crown of thorns. And he was nailed to that cursed tree. And when he had to breathe in and gasp for breath, that splintery wood rubbed up against his open wounds. His body was broken and his blood was shed for you. And more than that, more than this physical thing, more than the physical things that Christ endured, he endured also the wrath of God. He endured the anguish of being cursed by God, the eternal weight of God's wrath upon his soul whose heart melted 
within him because of being forsaken by God and crushed by God for our sins. This glorious Jesus for our sins. And he looked into that cup, that cup of God's wrath, and he endured everything in it to the last drop. It is dry. Put your nose in that cup. Smell it. You can't even smell a scent of God's wrath for you to endure. You know what's in that cup for you, Christian? You know what's in that cup that you get to drink now? The abundant riches of God's mercy and grace and kindness and love which he pours into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Does that not move your hearts to make you desirous to endure anything and everything for the sake of the elect. I want to take you back 2,000 years to the cross. And these things that you're unwilling to endure, I hope it would sicken you to look Christ in the face as he's covered in blood, as his heart melts within him. I hope it would sicken you to even think about telling him what you're unwilling to endure for the sake of others. I hope it would sicken you to consider being unwilling to endure anything for the sake of the elect as he's being crushed for your sins. Consider Christ this morning, believer. If anything will move you to apply this passage and be willing to endure anything or everything for the sake of the elect, may it be that Christ endured everything for you. And to the non-Christian this morning, I display Christ Jesus for you. I tell you of of Him and His glory, of this cross where He was crushed by God for our sins. I beg of you to look upon that cross, to look at Christ who endured everything on that cross and say, He did that for me. He endured that for me. Believe it sinner, believe it, and you will obtain salvation in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Do not wait. Why wait when this is a free gift offered to you now? If you are not a Christian this morning, if you have not put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, today is the day. While you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. If you hear it, go and follow him. Believe this gospel. Believe that Christ died for your sins, took the wrath of God, endured it for your sake, and you will obtain the salvation. If that is you this morning, I ask that you would come and approach me or one of the elders after the service. We would pray with you and, and, and talk with you more about how you might obtain this salvation, this free gift, this wonderful Jesus Christ. Please seek somebody out. Don't put this aside. If you're sick and you're at the doctor's office and he wants to give you medicine, you don't say, hold up doc, let me get a little worse. Let me get a little sick, a little more sick before you give me that medicine. You need this now. You need Christ Jesus now. So please, Do not harden your hearts. If you hear his voice, follow. Follow. Let us pray. Jesus, we praise you for what you endured for our sake. The wrath that we deserve, the cross that we should have been nailed to, the wrath, that eternal weight of your wrath should have been upon our souls. Or you chose rather to put it upon your son who endured it for us that we might obtain salvation, that we might have eternal glory in him. Such a wonderful seen at the cross. Lord, may it humble all of our hearts. May it shut up all of our objections. O Spirit, give us revelation and and understanding of the depth of Christ's love on the cross for us. Cause it to change us. 
Cause us to be willing, Lord, to endure everything, whatever it might be, for the sake of the elect. Lord, if there even be any here who are as sheep wandering without a shepherd, I pray, Lord, that they would hear your voice. I pray they would follow. Lord, would today be the day of salvation for any sinner that has joined us this morning. For any non-Christian here, Lord, may today be the day they are saved from their sins and obtain this salvation. Lord, what a joy that would be to see a sinner come home to Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you and we love you. May we worship you now and behold your cross and survey it and just be humbled at what you endured for us. In your name.